Hello, good evening, Namaskar. My name is Jatin Das. And uh, I started the JD Center of Art along with some like-minded friends in Bhubaneshwar in Odessa, this 1997. This was an indulgence because throughout 60 years, I had collected innumerable artifacts, antiquity, not only in India, but from many parts of the world, Egypt, Africa, etc., China, Japan. So the house was full. This is also like shedding baggage. So we set up the JD Center of Art. It will come a long way. Uh, both my two children have been very involved in it and innumerable other scholars and close friends who have in contributing to the center. The building is ready. Uh, the very famous architect, my dear friend, B.V. Doshi, Balakrishna V. Doshi, the architect in Ahmedabad, had designed the center. As I said, the building is ready. The interior galleries are picked up. The uh, arts and craft collection is already in store in Bhubaneswar, but the painting, etc., lying in Delhi, they have to go later. And we hold a National Documentary Film Festival on Art every year for 13 years, but it stopped because of the uh, COVID and it has been interrupted for two years. Then the, the main program which has gone on is Be The Artist program. I think it's one of the few institutions in the country which has uh, un gone on uninterrupted for more than 20 years, every second Saturday of the month in the evening. And recently, because of the COVID and other problems, we have online in collaboration with India International Center in New Delhi. And uh, we have had innumerable scholars, critics, historians, artists, artisans, on the same platform, we discuss about them, their work, and uh, people get to know about them. Ashok Chatterjee is a very, very, very dear friend of mine. And we had two mentors, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay and uh, Pupul Ben, Pupul Jaikar. Uh, although Ashok is older than me, but we both had connection. One of the reasons I came to Delhi was because of Pujaika. So uh, a craft council that my son Siddharth went to study in an ID where Ashok was there. Ashok lives in Ahmedabad, a great scholar. And about him, now Nandita will take over and talk about him. And we're very happy and welcome Ashok. Welcome to JDCA, Big Artist Program. We call it MTA. Uh, Nandita, ma'am, you're, you're, uh, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Baba, for that introduction to JDCA and um, also to Professor Chatterjee. If any of you are in Bhuvneshwar, please do make it a point to come and see the site, the construction, but also the collection. Um, we'll be happy to share the information for it. I'm going to do the formal introduction, which my brother should have done because Siddharth was your student professor and it would have been delightful for him to sort of, um, you know, not just give a formal introduction, but I'm sure he would have peppered it with lots of other lovely trivias that we would have liked to hear. But um, I haven't had the opportunity to read it beforehand because I was at a function. So please pardon if it doesn't do full justice to all the wonderful work you've done. Um, but I'll just start with what your where you studied. So Professor Chatterjee received his education at Woodstock School in Missouri, then St. Stephen's College in Delhi, and then the Miami University in Ohio. He has a background in the engineering industry, international civil service, India Tourism Development Corporation, and 25 years he served at the National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad where he was the executive director, senior faculty, distinguished fellow, 
and Professor of Communication and Management. Professor Chatterjee has served uh, a range of development institutions in India and overseas, particularly in the sectors of drinking water, sanitation, disability, livelihoods and education, as well as working with artisans in many parts of the country. He was honorary president of the Crafts Council of India for over 20 years and continues to serve CCI. An author and writer, his books include Dances of the Golden Hall, on the art of Shanta Rao and Rising on empowerment efforts among deprived communities in rural Gujarat. Professor Chatterjee continues to assist design education and lives in Ahmedabad with his son Keshav, daughter-in-law Prativa and grandchildren Kabir and Alisa. A very warm welcome to you. We are delighted to have you in our MTA today. If there's anything else that you want to add, I'm sure in, in your presentation you will talk much more in detail, but if there's anything that has been missed out in your formal introduction, please do enlighten us with that. So over to you. Thank you, Nandita. Thank you, Jatin. And regards to Siddharth, wherever he is. Thank you so much. The privilege to be here. And also, I think I would like to remind the audience that one of the most glorious collections of Indian craft is a collection of panthas, hand fans, <laughs> which the art have, which is quite stunning. And in a sense, it's symbolic of what is to follow. Today, we talk, we're talking about craft pioneers, and perhaps the first thing we ought to ask ourselves is, why should we be worried about craft pioneers? And I think the reason, may, reason that we need to do that is that we need to relearn some of the lessons which they try to teach us during their time with us, because the sector is in crisis. And that crisis has been made much more acute by the COVID pandemic. But it was in crisis before that. And it was not too long ago when my colleagues in the Crafts Council and I when talking to us, at the, having conversations at the highest levels of policy making in New Delhi, came across a frightening term that was applied to the craft sector and to our work in that sector. It was described, and these are the very words that were used, as a sunset sector that was out of place in the struggle to lift India to a new international status as a world power, and that crafts belong to the, to the past, not to our future. And we should give up a sentimental attachment toward a more pragmatic understanding of what a new century was demanding. To encounter such a dismissal in a country in which crafts was at the center of the freedom struggle, and which was the first country anywhere in the world we put crafts into the whole planning of a centralized economy. That was a shock to us. Uh, after all, we grew up with the view that you could not distinguish India from the, from the rest of the world if you took away crafts. But here we were, and in order to recover from our depression, we decided some years ago to have our national meeting in Vishnu in Shantiniketan, Vishnu Bhakti, trying to go there to understand what Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore might have encountered in his early days when he started the craft renaissance more than a hundred years ago. And in that process, we began to understand that the challenges that we were facing at this time were not different to the challenges that he, he faced, and that we too must have the resilience that he and his good friend and Hamsafar uh, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi had at that time when they took the craft heritage into the center of the freedom struggle. Today, <clears throat> we are in a situation in which the ignorance and neglect continue on the one side, 
Whereas on the other side, despite all the problems, there are huge opportunities and a powerful new narrative that reinforces what the pioneers felt about the sector and its importance to our future. The resilience of the sector has been severely tested through COVID and it has come through in an extraordinary way, which I will touch upon later. But we do need to recharge our energies and to draw hope and inspiration from those pioneering spirits who gave us the ground on which all of us stand today. What do they expect of us? As heirs to their legacy, but also heirs to the responsibilities that accompany it. My focus today will be on two great partners, Kamna Devi Chattopadhyay and Pupul Jayakar. Often regarded as rivals in New Delhi's corridors of power, they had a difficult relationship. Yet, they shared as value and vision. What they shared as value and vision was much more important than the trivia of what their political tensions might have been. We need to relate their common understanding of craft as a civilizational value and as identity that helps us to understand who we are as Indians, where we have come from, and where we might want to go, so that our heritage enriches not only our own future, but the future of the entire world. And here I should mention that when I speak, I speak not just of India, but of this entire subcontinent, which is perhaps the only place on the globe where there is an unbroken history of thousands of years of craft activity, which has come through without a break. And I emphasize that, without a break, right down to this new century. Kamadevi and Pupulgan were tall figures on the world stage. When they spoke, the world listened. They need to be heard again, and perhaps first of all, in their own country, at a time of such immense cha change, of threat, of challenge, but also of opportunity. The pioneering spirit of these two great ladies is not confined just to them. Their work has inspired new generations, pioneers that are, are at work as we speak, and many of them are artisans, old and young men and women. When I speak today, I will be not be referring to the artisans. I should be, but that would require more time and perhaps another session. My discussion will be primarily on the experience of those like myself, who are not artisans, but who work with artisans or are committed to serve them. So my hope is that what we share this evening may encourage past, present, and future leadership to draw on the past towards the future. I think one of the problems of my generation is that we took crafts for granted. And that's why we got the slap in the face when somebody decided to call us representatives of a sunset sector. Since then, things have got worse, not better. Yet there's huge hope, huge opportunity. And we have to remember that because at the center of all this, is the concept of human well-being that Kamla Devi and Pupul Ben shared. They were not sentimental about crafts. They saw crafts as essential to the progress, not only of our civilization, but to the survival of our planet. To what Rabindranath Tagore so beautifully described as life in its completeness. That was what crafts meant to Pupul Dev. And that's what hopefully it should continue to mean to us. So now let's just go to the slide, if we can have the first one. When we talk of the past, what do we actually talk about? Next. What is in our collective memory? Next, please. Is the records that we have of our past. Ajanta, and next, 
miniature paintings, and then all the records we have from our uh, recorded history give us a whole directory of the craft, craft skills that have come down to us through these ages, ever since the Indus Valley civilization. We cannot now dwell on that incomp incomparable legacy. So we have to take a big leap to what we might discover, dis uh, describe as the beginning of our present. Next, please. And here we go to Guru Dev. Next, please. Any problem? So just give us one second. Why it's not switching? It is Guru Dev who, over a hundred years ago, began his experiments in craft revival at Vishwamitri. And what he was trying to do was to indicate that the crafts were not just about our, our identity and our past, but about our future. You see him here, surrounded by the furniture that he was designing and working. Oops. Am I still there? You see him here in Vishwabharati at the time when he was working on his first experiments in craft redevelopment. Now, I think it is important to remember that India's post-independence uh, understanding of the essential role of crafts began with the horror of partition. It began in these refugee camps in Delhi, where millions had moved across the border and were in desperation. It was at this time that, can we have the next slide, that Jawaharlal Nehru asked Kamla Devi to do something. And what did she do? She moved into these camps with needle, thread, and textile and asked the women who were there, many of whom had gone through the most extraordinarily difficult and horrifying experiences, to make things that would give them a sense of dignity, of self-worth, and that she would sell these for them and provide them a livelihood that could start their new lives on this side of the border. This was the beginning of the Indian Cooperative Union. This was the beginning of what was to become Central Cottage Industries Emporium on Janpat. And that demonstration would, express, would spread across the country. It's important to remember this because the craft movement in our country after independence, after having been at the center of the freedom movement, Became, became an expression of disaster management. And in these disaster prone days, there is a lesson in that for us. Next. As a result of these experiences, crafts moved in to India's planning process. And I invite your attention to the highlighted words there. The importance of the sector it was believed, could scarcely have been exaggerated. Not only were we the first, uh, first country to recognize the importance of crafts in centralized planning, but the uh, CCIC and all that was to, to follow was Using my papers here, <laughs> was to be part of a whole infrastructure which Kamla Devi and later Pupul Jayakar began to develop. And these included the All India Handicrafts Board, the offices of the development commissioners for handicrafts and handlooms, the regional development centers, the craft museum, schemes of recognition for craft excellence, 
the weaver service centers that Papur Jaikar was to lead, and then the Handi Handloom and Handicraft Export Corporation and the Sona Network. Let's have a pause here for a moment. You can take off this slide. It's important to understand that these institutions provided a support system for a movement that would attract the finest creative talent in this country. The, the institutions that I've just described attracted people such towering uh, influences such as K.G. Subramaniam, Hakusha, Ritan Mazumdar, Jatin himself was part of this. And Kamla Devi went on to create the Crafts Council of India and its chapters across its states, mobilizing talent that would help shape the future, including people like my colleagues Vijay Rajan, Ruby Pal Chaudhary, Geeta Ram, and their successors like Manju and Purnima, who are here with us. Next. Meanwhile, next slide, please. Meanwhile, something was happening in Gujarat. The two ladies you see here to the left, to my left is Veera Sarabhai and to her left is Pupul Jaikar. Veera Sarabhai and Pupul Jaikar were working together to establish what would become the Calico Museum of Textiles. This was a su suggestion that had been made to Geera Ben by Ananda Kumaraswamy and the museum itself would aid the understanding of a new generation about what constitutes craft quality and become a magnet for national and global attention. Something else was also happening here. Next, please. India was to take its first step into using crafts as cultural diplomacy, something that we are hearing a great deal about in the present government which seems to have forgotten that, they are, that the notion and the demonstration of cultural diplomacy began 60 to 70 years ago through Pupul Jaikar. She was asked to curate an exhibition of Indian crafts at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. This effort brought Pupul and Kamla Devi together. And what happened at MoMA at New York was to be a watershed event with far ranging impact. The conversations and the reflections that took place in New York were to lead on to an invitation by Jawaharlal Nehru to the Los Angeles design team of Charles and Ray Eames to visit India. Next. The Eames, Ray, Charles Eames and his wife, Ray, were to create an India report and in that India report, they made the handmade lota next as the symbol of, of, of quality and service, which a new profession of industrial design could bring to India. From this seed, NID was established. Now we can take the slides off for a moment. I would like to talk about what happened after this event, NID was, was created and all that would follow. There were pioneers at NID like Nelly Setna, Halina Perantupa, Dashat Patel, Kumar Vyas, and later Upadhyay and others like Aditi Ranjan, Gito Patni, MP Ran Ranjan, Krishna Patel, Neela Mayer, and so many others. There'll be a lot of names that I will, that I will bring up. And the reason for this is that many in the new generation of people in the craft movement, as well as in the design movement in our country, have little no, or no idea of these stalwarts who did so much to bring us through and to give us the demonstrations which have become so important to us. It was not only at NID. The experiments stretched beyond NID beginning, for example, at the IDC and Powai, followed by the NIFT network and the <clears throat> uh, pioneering work that was done by Judy Freiter in Kutch through Kalaraksha and the Somaya Kalavidyana, as well as the Indian Institute of Crafts in, in Jaipur. All 
these efforts over all these dec decades get rooted in that early commitment and demonstration by the pioneers Kamla Devi and Pupur Jayakar. Next. All this while, the Central College Industries Emporium in Delhi became the sh next piece, became the show window of Free India's handcraft capabilities. And through cottage industries and what would be connected to, cottage, to that movement, you had pioneering talent such as Shona Ray, Ratna Fabri, Mini Boga, Ayola Basu, Ravi Sikri, Ram and Bharati Sharma, and others. I don't know if Gurshan Nanda, Gurshanji is with us this evening, but she can share her own experience of this incredible richness that was celebrated at Cottage. Next. What was happening there was also part of the incredible contribution that Crafts was beginning to make to India's diplomatic efforts and its determination to include Crafts in the understanding of India as a modern nation. Among those who were involved in this ferment, next, were Ritan Mozumda, next, and Mini Boga, two designers who would attract the attention of a young American entrepreneur, next, called John Bissell. Here he is at the time when he was establishing Fab India, an ent enterprise that would become a transforming influence on a new generation's understanding of its own Indian identity and introduce a new term into the lexicon of Indian craft. That term was lifestyle. I'll pause here for a minute to indicate that what was happening in Delhi and <clears throat> had its impact elsewhere. For example, in Bombay, Vaina Modi created contemporary arts and crafts. In time, Faith Singh would start a Noki in Jaipur. Ashish and Christine Jana had established the Valora studio in Calcutta. Pratibha Shah would take bundles of textiles across the country in her effort to provide artisans with a stable income. Raghunath Goswami made sem seminal efforts in design promotion in the Eastern region. B.B. Basin created through Gujari in Gujarat an example of what a state-sponsored institute could achieve in setting standards of craft excellence. All these become a context within which new leaders like Martin Singh or Mapu and Rajiv Sethi would soon emerge making their own incredible demonstrations and <clears throat> providing a new, new dimensions to our craft development activities. Both Mapu and Rajiv were protégés of Kamla Devi and Pupul Jaikar, and both would be pioneers themselves, setting new standards of craft excellence. Other institutions like Dastakar, Dastakar Hat Samiti, Sasha in Calcutta, Dakshina Chitra in Madras, the Crafts Council's own Kamala stores, Banglanatak.com, all of these would inspire and motivate other generations of craft entrepreneurs. While in new institutions like the Craft Revival Trust and the Ritu Seti have guided the sector towards frameworks for craft research and scholarship. Next, in this process, Next. Next, please. I think we've got. In this process, a new approach to design education brought artisans and designers into a relationship of joint learning and creation. Next. This would spread with new networks, not only through NID, but through NIFT, through IICD in Jaipur through Shristi in Bangalore and other centers of design, learning, and practice. 
that would suit, would include IDC in Powai and in Guwahati and to institutions devoted to cane and bamboo in the Northeast. These centers of design learning in which artisans were taking an increasingly important role have been a great force which today has, is erasing, if not already erased, the distinction between who is a designer, who is an artisan, and who is an artist. These terms are, are losing their, their, their sort of separateness. And we are going back to the age old concept of color as the activity to lift the quality of the environment through what we can do with our hands and minds. At this moment, let me pause and suggest and indicate that while all this was going on in the 60s and 70s, another force was tourism. Didi Contractor revived the Lake Palace Hotel in Udaipur. And the Taj Group was the first to bring crafts into the center of its infrastructure activities. Soon, Ramesh Thapa's leadership at the India Tourism Development Corporation would bring crafts into the center of a new strategy to develop tourism, both domestic and international. And thus, two of the world's largest industries were creating a synergy that was distinctly Indian and totally contemporary. We can take this slide off the screen. Within this mountain, there was the festivals of India. And the festival of, Ind of India would open up huge opportunities for artisans and those working with artisans and the new designers who are learning with artisans and learning through artisans. In the 80s and 90s, Purple Jayakar's festivals of India crossed the world and created enormous opportunities for people like Mapu, Rajiv, uh, Dashrat Patel, Zara Tayabji, and others. And most recently, last year, we've had a brilliant demonstration of what artisans and exhibition designers can do together through Noor Jahan Belgrami's incredible pavilion for Pakistan at the Dubai Expo. So if any of you have time, go to Facebook and take a look at what Pakistan was able to achieve. We can learn a lot from that. I point that out because all these, these years that uh, I have just spoken about, the Manthan is not just taking place in India. It is taking place throughout the, con the subcontinent. In 1974, Uksi Mufti opened the Lok Virsa campus just outside of Islamabad to demonstrate the richness and power of its folk culture. By 1978, Brack in Bangladesh had established its Arong brand of craft quality and Ruby Ghaznavi would soon follow, celebrating the textile traditions of that country in a contemporary mode through her Aranya outlet. In Sri Lanka, there would be others making waves including Barbara Sansoni's Barefoot Store and the Lakpahana Enterprise. Nepal became a hub of Himalayan craft cultures, introducing materials such as handmade papers, new fibers for textile production, and sheltering Tibet's craft heritage. The point I want to make here is that the entire subcontinent was impacted by the early craft pioneers, and it is the entire region that has demonstrated the relevance of, heritage, of this heritage to the future of humankind. So much of it concentrated in this neighborhood. Next. These new relationships need understanding. Next. Next. These new relationships need understanding against a backdrop of growing awareness around the world of the magnitude and power of creative industries. This was reflected in a gathering brought together by the World Bank and UN agencies in 2005 in Jodhpur, which led to the Jodhpur consensus on cultural industries. 
that was 17 or 18 years ago. And I draw your attention to the, ter that the highlighted terms that this sector produces goods and services with social and cultural meaning. India was the host to the Jodhpur consensus and India did nothing with it. There is no ministry or department in the government of India which is in charge of India's creative and cultural industries. And I'll come to that later. Next. About the time that we were despairing and packing our bags for Vishwa Bharati some years ago, this slogan emerged from the heart of the European Union. What was the European Union trying to say? Not that they would give up their machines and go back to handmade industries entirely, but the importance of the craft sector as a seedbed for creativity and innovation, without which no contemporary economy can survive. Next. Rajiv Sethi spent several months, perhaps several years, trying to get this across during a period when he was associated with the Planning Commission. He documented the possibilities of a national mission for India's creative and cultural industries. His plea fell on deaf ears. Next. So what is at stake? We are told today that we need between 10 million and 15 million new jobs. And artificial intelligence is facing us with a frightening prospect of jobless growth. We do know that at present, 90% of India's workforce is in the so-called informal, so-called unorganized sector, both adjectives which are far from true about crafts, which are neither informal nor unorganized, but that is how they've come to be known. Next. Go back to what the first five-year plan had to say about the importance of this sector <clears throat> and compare that with what we heard from India's finance minister just before COVID struck. Next. Nirmala Sitaraman said that the informal sectors where the majority of Indian employment is, and that apparently there was stress there, and she was willing to hear from us. The finance minister of the government of India is saying that she doesn't know what's happening in the, in the informal sector where 90% of jobs are, but she'll be happy to hear from them. Soon COVID would put millions on the road through that incredibly brutal lockdown. And of those millions were on the highways and by lanes of this country struggling to get home, of those millions, most were artisans who had gone in search of livelihood to cities which were now turning their back on them. This is incredibly important because what this terrible experience has done is informed huge numbers of Indians that the future really belongs where they are in their rural settings. And as that is where we have to find job opportunities which are not farm linked. And that is where crafts represents such a colossal opportunity. Next. But why should anyone invest in this sector when we don't even know how many artisans constitute the world's largest resource of artisanal skills and wisdom? Next. Here is a table to show you the range of calculations about how many artisans we have, we should be looking after. Take a look at that estimate of 10 to 11 million, which is the official estimate of the Ministry of Textiles, which is supposed to be looking after artisans. However, the Ministry of Textiles is not even in charge of Khadi, the greatest textile we have, which comes under the Ministry of MSME. As a result of the efforts of civil society, we were able in 2016 
to get artisans included for the very first time in the sixth economic census. And that established that there are 12 to 16 million, not just artisans, but artisan entrepreneurs. Amazing that 2 million, artist, uh, 2 million entrepreneurs would employ between them six to eight persons each or lift the figure to 12 million to 16 million from an official estimate of 11. But other estimates range from 200 to 250 million. The last 250 million being an estimate from the former chairman of Microsoft. Now, how can a sector progress if the data is so bad? Next. This is the range of authorities that are supposed to look after artisans in our country. They never meet. There is no platform that brings them together. During COVID, not even half an hour of consideration was given to this sector, whereas other industries could lobby and could extract concessions and support programs. Next. It was this census that counting entrepreneurs made a profound recommendation that the sector was too important to be left in this doubt and that there should be a census specific to handmade in India. What that census would require is a methodology. And we at the Crafts Council of India and our partners were asked to develop that methodology. To develop that methodology, we needed a small sum of money. And we have spent the last 10 years trying to find that money. And we still do not have it. Next. So what would Kamla Devi next? And what would Pupul Jayakar expect us to do in this situation. Next. The craft sector, as COVID now makes more urgent, is the opportunity for non-farm, labor-intensive, employment-intensive, value-added activity to people where they are located, for sustainable jobs at the bottom of the pyramid. Next. There are new arguments now, arguments that Gurudev and Gandhiji did not have at their time, but we have, and that is in the global search for sustainability. Next. In that search for sustainability, let us keep in mind that this huge sector of artisans is made up primarily for those who are still at the margins of Indian society perhaps not just India, but throughout the subcontinent. And you only have to understand that if we look at the so-called Naxal Belt, the Northeast and Kashmir, these terribly sensitive areas, which are also our most craft rich. What does that tell us about the experience of Indian planning? Next. One thing that we can take strength for is that the demand overseas for handmade quality is virtually unlimited. It has never gone down. Despite global finance crises, despite COVID, it has never gone down and become a huge magnet for international tourism. Next. So what can we do to bring the creative and cultural uh, activities into the center of national priority, just as other countries have done, including so many of our Asian neighbors, as well as Italy, Scandinavia, and Latin America. Next. This is what the sector offers. And compared to any other industry, it would be difficult to find such a range of contributions which one sector alone can provide. Next. The biggest opportunity we have today is the sustainable development goals, which are today the global measures of progress. 
if you just see the top line of environment and resilience, livelihood, knowledge and skills, inclusion and participation, this is what Kamla Devi and Pupur Ben spent their lives trying to do in their work for their own country. This is the opportunity we have. There are 17 sustainable development goals. The craft sector addresses 11 of those 17 directly. I would challenge anyone to indicate any other industry which can make such a huge contribution to sustainable development. Yet, when India reports its progress twice a year to the United Nations on the SDGs, it does not include the craft sector. And why does it not include the craft sector? Because it does not have the data. So we are back to the crisis of reliable data. Next. Next. Let's end with returning to Kamla Devi, Chattopadhyay, and Pupul Ben. What is important here in this reflection by Kamla Devi is her statement that nothing is created without a purpose. It is that sense of purpose that we need to return to. And Kamla Devi made another observation. Next. And that was a political one. That if you that through crafts, you can ensure the decentralization of economic and political power, something that recent times have shown that we desperately need. Next. Pupul, Pupul Jayakar was extraordinary in her understanding of how to marry culture with the marketplace. She understood and she taught many of us that you have to be rooted in culture if your marketing efforts are to have the kind of relevance that we seek. Next. And what she was seeking is what so many of the young pioneers have now tried to do. To draw on culture, to draw on the past, but in a sense to make that past relative to a new age and to the new technologies that, are, that surround us. To give artisans the skills and the capacities to deal with the changes that are taking place all around them, including, I might add, artificial intelligence. Next. It was through the festivals of India that I mentioned earlier that Pupul Ben was able to make such an impact on the image of India overseas, something that the present government should remember in <clears throat> its own efforts and attempts to pretend that they have invented cultural diplomacy, but more on that perhaps at some other time. Next. So where do we go from here? To my mind, the next steps basically demand learning from the COVID experience, learning from the fate of those migrants, ensuring that that does not happen again, building fresh systems of support for artisans, for entrepreneurship and marketing, access to design and new technologies and social security, building that reliable database without which investments will not take place and building platforms which do not exist that can bring the sector together. Indeed, bring the sector together across the region and give artisans a voice in national policy. Create the awareness of craft value and craft quality because the future will depend on the awareness, attitudes and taste of new generations. Next. And perhaps here we have an example of what we mean by crafts and its link with human well being and sustainable development. Thank you very much, and I hope I have not exceeded my time. Very wonderful. Thank you. That was really, really wonderful. Baba, would you like to take, take I, it forward? I recollect the 60 years 
Uh, I came to New Delhi in 1968. We can't hear anybody. Uh, can, you, can, you, uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Ashok, can you hear me now? Mute. Hello? Maybe Hello? your uh, sound setting. Could you just check? Yeah. Is it okay now? No, I think it's on at his end because I can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah, okay. can you? Are we on silent mode? Yeah, I think we can hear you, but maybe there is a setting that's off where you can hear others. On your computer, if you see the sound button, is there someone to also help you there? No. Nobody's there. Mm -hmm. Hello? Ashok? If you if you see on your I can't hear you. I know. Um, wait. Let me let me send you a chat, and uh, if you can read it, can you call him, Avantika? Can you call him? Yeah. I can now hear you. Now you can hear. Okay, great. Managed to switch it on. Great. Um, it's reminiscing and recollecting many of these things of uh, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay and. Uh, I remember her putting a java flower on her hair uh, at IIC. And then Pupul Ben, when I was in Bombay, he, she told me to come to Delhi. So one of the reasons I came to Delhi was because of Pupul Ben. And I became a designer, con design consultant at Handicraft and Loom Export Corporation. And there were many people in Weaver Service Center, Design Center, many artists who worked including K.G. Subramaniam, etc., etc. And it was a wonderful time. And uh, uh, Ashok has given a complete story in a short time about the entire journey, which has been for about 70 years or whatever. But the time has come, the government and public and others should put their mind uh, to the you know, when we say craft, I'm not sure I like the word. The mm -hmm. colonial British talked about uh, uh, the traditional workers' craft and mm -hmm. as if I, as a contemporary artist, I carry a banner on my chest. You know, frankly, I think uh, traditional arts and craft is 100 times richer than the contemporary art forms. You know, even though I'm a contemporary artist, I'm saying it. Um, Jatin, I think we need to re return to the concept of Kala. That's right, exactly. And because Kala includes engineering, architecture, exactly. music, exactly. dance, yeah. mathematics. Yeah. It includes everything. We don't need to be in these boxes. Yeah. And I think one other point I would like to make, Please. I should have done this earlier, yeah. is that we have to stop depending on the government of India. Yeah. Yeah. The government of India did a great deal for the crafts. Yeah. But it is irrelevant now. It doesn't understand what is happening in the marketplace. Yes, indeed. And we now need to be much more independent of the government. No, it's very simple. I remember Kamala Devi said that the weavers have survived because our women wear saris. As yes. simple expression is that, how loaded it is. Likewise. Whether it is a charpoy, whether it's a muda, whether it's a kaseka thali, whether it's a chatai or a, or, or a Manipuri mattress, you know, and all this part of a organic growth in a particular area accordingly. See, I have the collection of hand fans. The khajur pankha is more in the north uh, and, and northwest. Dalpatteka Pankha is more in the eastern part and southern part of India because that's what it, where it grows. So likewise, crafts, uh, I think the, the term has to be, uh, you know, it's like modern National Gallery of Modern Art. You know, it's a wrong word, you know, and things like that. Shall uh, we open it for questions now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Questions, questions or even... Thoughts that you want to share, and please feel free to switch on your camera when you are speaking. There are also people on YouTube. Avantika, are you checking on if there are any questions on YouTube? Please, you can read them out. Or anybody just wants to share and add more to this conversation? May I? Please. 
You know, this is a live uh, question. <laughs> so, I'm a person who's very new to I mean, this kind of conversations, which uh, you know, all, all of you are great scholars and so on. But don't you think, uh, ultimately, I mean, there is more awareness of crafts now, because whenever I go to well, of all places, to, to the hospital where I've been going for uh, regularly, I find a lot, many more ladies wearing uh, hand blocked printed saris uh, and you know, things like that. So I feel that wasn't so maybe 20 years ago. There is awareness. But what I'm, uh, I'm trying to make a point of about is shouldn't craft, uh, I mean, shouldn't uh, craft organically become part of our lives, of our everyday lives, you know, like, in our homes, in our, which, which is not so. It, it's like a, like a, a person talking with, a, a, a speaking into a cell phone and, you know, and whatever in English or in, uh, Tamil or whatever. But do we, don't you think we should aim at getting crafts in, into our everyday lives? That is, I don't see that is happening with, with the middle. It is happening, but not as much as it should, I think. That is what know. Guru Dev tried to do a hundred years ago. That's why he started the craft activity at Vishwanayati. That's why he started a shop in Calcutta in order to get people to understand the value of the functional aesthetics of craft in everyday life. It's still the challenge. And I think here there's no simple answer, but uh, you've already suggested some, the garments we wear, the, the objects that we have, and uh, for example, I learned recently that Noika wanted its uh, new range of cell phones to have a handmade appearance because people wanted a sense that when they were buying a phone, they were buying something that was special. So there are many new opportunities. We have to keep at it. But unless there is strong consumer demand for handmade quality, all our efforts will fail. And today, there is no organization to actually do that demand creation. It's a huge job. It's a marketing job. It takes masses of money. And there's no organization, no ministry, no corporation which is investing in that. Thank you. Yes, Rajan. <laughs> Can't hear you. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you for an absolutely enlightening uh, talk. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty shocked with the pathetic uh, uh, state of affairs. And, uh, and nobody seems to be bothered. Uh, and as you say, government has created no platform. Uh, from the private sector, uh, what are your thoughts about how this platform can be created and how the census can come about and what does the future looks like to you in, in the current circumstances? Well, I do think that the one mistake that both Pupulman and uh, Kamna Devi made was not to involve economists with the craft movement right from the beginning. Because all the, we took it for granted that the crafts would always be there. Now we've realized that we have to make a case for the crafts. And the first case that has to be made, unfortunately, is the economic one. Because things that cannot be counted fall through the cracks. Now, if we don't have the data, the investment will not be made. And therefore, uh, the Craft Council of India and its partners have put this, have been spending the last 12 years running from pillar to post to get this. And we still have to do it. Because unless we have the data, Who's going to invest in the sector? You can't run to a corporation and to the corporate sector and ask for investment if you can't give them any data of where the investment should go and why it should go there. So we need to do that, and that government can do. Interestingly, the only champions that we have found in the government for what we are doing and for the sector is in the Ministry of Statistics. The very last place that we thought we would find sympathy we have found the most support. So we have to do that. The other thing is, forget about the government creating the platforms. It will not do it. We have to create the platforms. 
we have to find the spaces that can bring the sector together to share. We are not doing it. We should be doing it, but we're not doing it. And we should be doing it not just in India, but across the region. It is the subcontinent that must speak for the sector. The sector belongs to the whole subcontinent. It is an South Asian advantage and South Asia must speak for it. Thank you. Um, I'd Thank like you. to add here, yeah, if I may. Please. Um, I'm Nujha Milgrami, Ashok Chatterjee, humbled by what you said, and as always, go back feeling so enriched by whenever you speak. You are a treasure for across the region. You're absolutely right. We definitely need regional support. We have similar issues across Asia. And I think we need to strengthen ourselves and governments will not help. I totally agree with you. And But I think we need to maybe have the Zoom is fabulous because I'm sitting here in Karachi and I'm able to hear every word that you have spoken. And um, I think we need to form a small group of people who can be perhaps sow the seeds which Purple Jaikar and Kamla Devi did, there are different ways of using the new technology in order to at least get our thinking caps together. And perhaps this, the people who are here can connect and have more focused discussions into how these things can be actually implemented. It has to go beyond into an action forum rather than just too much talk that goes on and you are our leader. So lovely to hear you, thank you. I think it's the young people who should now take over, but I do believe there's an opportunity here. And I was just talking to somebody from Bhutan the other day to say that really the leadership it needs to go from people from places like Bhutan, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, which can bring the subcontinent together without all these hassles that we have between India and Pakistan to get together. Uh, we can't wait for sanity to descend on the subcontinent. The only ones who can provide the spaces where we can meet are Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. And I wish I knew how to do that. But as you say, we have Zoom and we can start. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, well, I'd just like to say that, you know, JDCA is a small effort. It's not only about the center in Odisha that we are trying to build, but um, we also started a film festival. And uh, my father, who's the founder, the idea of starting the film festival was that, yes, there will be an art center, but then who will come? People want to go to malls and, you know, film theaters. Why would they even want to come? So let's create and understanding, awareness, sensitivity around these issues. And that's why every year we used to, we haven't done it in the last three years, but the whole idea of film festival, the whole idea of meet the artist, all these things were to create that kind of conversation and awareness and, you know, know who's doing what and exchange of ideas. Uh, so, and, and it's unfortunate that despite the fact that we have started now collaborating with India International Center, the attendance is very erratic sometimes there's very few people sometimes if the person is a little more popular or they bring their own friends and family then it's a little more but that's the situation around art and craft and you know if there is an if there's an architect who's speaking then people from design and art do not come so we've also created these silos so the idea would be also how do we not just this, but various such initiatives. How do we support each other? How do we spread the word in our own little constituencies? So I would request all of those who are here. I know there are many who do attend very often, like Lekha Bhagat, Purnima Rai, Dadi Padamji. But if all of you, like yourself, Nurjah um, Ji, you are Karachi, you are joining. So, you know, I'm sure there are people there. Um, Zoom has enabled us that geographically we are not bound we can reach out so I would request all of you that this is 
on every second Saturday um, at five o'clock. So please do spread the word. We'd be if you want to put your email ID on the chat. Anybody who's joined new and you want us to keep you informed, then uh, please do let us know, and we will inform you and let you know when we have who's the next speaker in our MTA. So thank you very much. Any closing thoughts, Hello. Professor Chatterjee? If you want to. I'm sorry that there was a technical break, but that's something we have to deal with. I think that one thing that uh, perhaps we should uh, also be very conscious of is that in addition to all the other challenges, let's keep in mind that the heart of everything is what Pupil understood so very well, is mm. the market of creating demand for handmade quality. And that is a task that we all have to do. Uh, there may be no central authority to do that for us. We'll have to find innovative and creative ways to do this. <clears throat> but it's extremely important that we do that. The other is to understand that the artisans are facing uh, new challenges, such as artificial intelligence. Yes. <laughs> which are both opportunities as well as threats. And we need to ensure that they have all the support systems that they need in order to be able to tackle the uncertainties of our time. They're not just the political uh, climate change uncertainties, which are huge enough. Yeah. You can just imagine what is happening to the artisans who live around Joshimat, for example. But there are all these new challenges of artificial intelligence, of intellectual property rights, of being able to cope with things like GST and so on. The need for entrepreneurship training and support is simply huge. And I would like to say that one of the gifts that COVID has given us is the demonstration of how resilient our artisans are and also how many groups and individuals have come together in new coalitions, in new support groups to help artisans as a result of COVID. So although COVID has meant immense suffering, it has also demonstrated that we are not necessarily dependent on government to see us through. We need to be some water. Okay. Sorry, I think it was. Siddharth had just joined. <laughs> yeah. He was in Hyderabad at an opening of a interpretation museum that he was doing. So Siddharth, your professor is here with a, he yes. a fantastic presentation. <laughs> Do you want to just yeah. say a few words? Uh, sorry, AC, I missed your presentation, but we are here at the British residency at the back. <laughs> which is the former British residency. But I had the privilege of actually doing the last bit of my student life with AC. And, uh, but also interacting with Pupulji in some ways at the last stage of her life, AC, because of Rishi Valley, but also NID. And, you know, the whole interaction you had with her was a very different interaction in her heyday with culture and arts. Uh, but I, you must have talked about your whole tenure at NID and how you, the legacy of Gira Ben also, amongst other things. But did you, uh, you mentioned, I remember there was a slide that you had on Javaja and the collaboration you did with I am. I did not talk about that. That's, that okay, but you, had, but you had a slide, you had a slide in it, no, yeah. as an image, I think. I use that, uh, Sadhar, to indicate yeah. <clears> through <throat> design education, new yeah. collaborations are taking place between artisans and designers. Yeah. And the fact that the distinction between so-called design and craft and art are rapidly disappearing. Yeah. I'm sure you would agree that people like you are as much artisans as you are designers. And yes. Artisans have become designers. Yeah. We need to dissolve these divisions. Yeah. And as I was telling your father that we need to go back perhaps to that uh, seminal concept of color. Yeah. brought our culture through these thousands of years and which makes no distinction. Some years ago, the great sculptor of Mahabalipuram uh, 
uh, Ganapati Stapati, yes. I asked him that we don't have a single word for design in any of our languages in India, not a single word. And yet we have the unbroken tradition of design going back thousands of years. Mm -hmm. I asked him to tell me what is design by Indian tradition. And he went back to this word kala. And he said that kala is anything which lifts the quality of life for, the, for, the, for those who live on this planet and for the planet itself. And I think we need to go back to that, to understand that it is that holistic understanding of quality that is important and not these distinctions of whether we call ourselves artisans or artists or craftsmen or what. What is the purpose of our endeavor? And that is where I think the UN Sustainable Development Goals give us such marvelous arguments, which are absolutely at the cutting edge in the 21st century. We're talking about tomorrow. We're not talking about the past. Could you talk a little bit about the Javaja project also, you see? Like, because it was, even though it happened such a long time ago, the whole idea of how, do you, how you, you people went to a village, which actually then you created this whole livelihood based on one craft and this kind of entrep entrepreneurial ability. Because uh, I remember my sister, when she was in college, had a Javaja bag, you know, and I remember Leila Tehebji in Dasakar used to sell, and it was such a rage, you know, getting the Javaja bag. I mean, you know, the way it started, the whole carpets and the leather things. And I hope Andita still has. If she doesn't, I will send her one. <laughs> I, think the, I, I think the Javaja project needs time. I don't know where we have that time. But please remember this, that the Javaja project was not a craft project. The Javaja project was an attempt by managers and designers to see if there's anything these new disciplines that India had imported from the West was there anything that they could offer at the gut level of problem solving in this country? And that gut level was poverty. And therefore, under the leadership of Ravi Nathai, we moved to an area of Rajasthan, which we were told by the Rajasthan government was incapable of quote unquote development. Ravi Nathai of IM. Eh? Ravi Nathai was then stepped down as director of IM. And he took us there. And we were there to test if there's anything that we knew that you could transfer to a community that was eating once in two days. And which was denied water from the village well because of their caste. So that was the circumstances in which we tested the power of design. It so happened that craft skills was about the only resource that this community had. And those skills were being challenged by competition from mass produced fabric and mass produced shoes and, and leatherware. And that is how craft moved into the center of the Javaja project. Because we had to create products that the money lender and the power system knew nothing about. And we had to market this in such a way that whatever profits accrued, this community would have the capability and the stamina and the strength to be able to retain those profits and not lose them. So crafts came into the center of the activity. It became a very important craft demonstration, but Javaja was not meant as a craft project. It became a craft project. And in the process, it made a demonstration in, which is incredibly important in global terms that design as a problem solving approach and design as an understanding of the human environment, that is what design can contribute to difficult situations, including the one we are now in. So it was a test by fire. And after 60, 70 years of working together, those artisans are still there and they are prospering and they're eating much more than twice a day. And they at last have access to the village well. 
but they are also facing huge problems of discrimination and oppression. So we have to understand that crafts is part of a very difficult Indian social and political uh, framework. There are no simple, simple solutions and there are no silver bullets. But what Javaja taught us is that if you want to make a difference to those at the margins of society where most of our craftsmen come from, then you have to understand what they are facing in their daily lives. And you have to listen to them. That is why we need these platforms where their voice can be heard. Can you imagine a situation where a lockdown is called of COVID and not even half an hour is spent by anyone in the government of India to listen to a community which may be as large as 250 million people. That's the kind of neglect that we are inflicting on these national treasures. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would want to ask uh, Mr. Chatterjee? I think Ahuja ji had raised the hand, but um, I probably didn't see it. If you'd like to say anything, please unmute yourself and feel free to ask. Ahuja ji, no? You don't want to ask? Okay. So thank you very much. Baba, do you want to just thank Professor Chatterjee as well from JDCA and all of us? Yeah, Ashok, wonderful. Professor Chatterjee <laughs> is recollecting innumerable uh, moments uh, with very, very special people all, all of our life. And uh, we still hope that it won't be called as craft. It'll be Kalat Magabod. Kala. <laughs> so we have to we have imbibed wrong uh, paradigms instead of our own paradigm we have imbibed wrong and we have this clash that's why I call it craft and art you know? so anyway it's, it's a very long process thank you very much Thank you. Uh, Ashok. Thank you. Very Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone else, for joining. And see you on second Saturday um, next month. Somebody has written, Dadi has written, Ashok, you need to document the journey of all that you aid and either dig digitize or print it for generations. <laughs> okay, Dadu. <Ed. laughs> Dadi, you can say it yourself, but I'm reading it out nonetheless. <laughs> that's true because you know unfortunately with a certain generation a lot of things are going to be lost and the younger generation will not share these concerns wouldn't know about it so i hope you're also documenting for the future generations i am trying to but i'm not at this age like there's not much i can do but i would like to point out that there's a very important documentation which will soon be out by ushmita sahu of the Imami Institute in Calcutta on the work of, <coughs> of Ritan Mazumdar. Mm -hmm. And that just indicates the huge resource that is available. People <coughs> whose names I mentioned, like Ayola Basu and Ratna Fabri and uh, Ravi Sikri, uh, Mini Boga, their work is not known. And it needs to be studied, it needs to be brought to light. So I think Ushmita's work with a gallery in Bombay, which is called Chatterjee and Love, is extremely important. And I think these are the opportunities we now have before it's too late to document what, what all these founding fathers and mothers did. <laughs> uh, for example, Ayola Basu's work, I believe, has all disappeared. It doesn't exist. The archives of the All India Handicrafts Board have disappeared. The board itself has been closed. Uh, Rajiv Sethi was not able to protect any of his work that he did for exhibitions like uh, The Golden Eye and uh, Aditi. It's all gone. 
Fortunately, Mapu's work in textiles has been preserved to some extent, and that's wonderful. But there are huge opportunities for documentation and research. And with the growing number of design schools and art schools, hopefully, uh, perhaps JD Center itself can uh, be a place where some of this documentation could take place.